Hey there, Alan from Praise here. I'm so glad you came across this resource, however it is that you found it. Um, I do want to mention a couple of things before we get into it. First, if you're in the Springfield area and you're not a part of a local church, we would love to have you as a part of Praise. If, however, you're further away, please know that this resource is in no way intended to replace the ministries of the local church in your life. In fact, we believe that the local church is the hope of the world and will make a difference for you. And so we would hope that you would get plugged in in one right near you. Now, if you do find this resource helpful, we would love it if you would give back to Praise in order to support this and make more of these uh, sorts of things available. The way you do that, just go to praise.church. If you go to praise.church, you'll be able to find a place to be able to give back to this. May the Lord use this in your life by the power of His Holy Spirit today. I don't know if you wonder sometimes what it is that we're doing every single Sunday as we gather together around uh, the Lord and worship, what it is that as we're singing these songs or as we open up the Word of God, what is it that we're seeking to accomplish every week? And um, it's something that I don't take lightly because of the fact that I am convinced, I know for a fact, that we are in a war. Every single week, the enemy is coming at us. And I've noticed something about him. He does not respect the Sabbath. He doesn't give you a break. He doesn't say, hey, this is a down moment. Let me give you some space. But the enemy comes at us constantly. And his lies, sometimes internal dialogue for us, is constant. And there's questions and there's fears because the enemy is constantly coming at us. And because he's coming at us in that way, it is so important that every single week that we sing songs about what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. Amen? And so we remind ourselves of these things in song. We sing them together. We praise him. And this is one of those things that is put in stark contrast in moments just like this. This is why we do what we do. Because each and every one of us will this week as the enemy bombards us with lie after lie, which is constant and unavoidable, we will have an opportunity this week at some point to either stand with those who, who maybe we shouldn't be standing with and maybe gain standing with those who really don't matter and lose standing with the Lord. Right Or just the opposite, to gain standing with the Lord and have others' opinions of us decrease. And in moments like that, it is so important that we have been reminded of the truths that do not change. See, civilization have risen and have fallen and the truth has remained, right? The ground has shifted around all other truth and all truth is called into question. But there is a truth which is bedrock for us. Why? Because the one who spoke it all also spoke the bedrock into being. And so we come back to it week after week after week and remind ourselves of these things. And that's what we're doing here today. And that's why we ask you to go deeper during the week to join with us in studying and reading together as families, memorizing scripture together as families, because it is so essential that each of us recognize there's a war going on. And if we don't, we're probably losing. But recognize that battle is constant and recognize that the enemy does not let up and neither can we. Amen. So if you haven't done it yet, go out to praise.fyi, tap on connect, sign up to join with us as we're memorizing scripture together, reading scripture together, uh, together with families gathering around scripture and what we're doing here on Sunday morning, taking it a step further. Part of what we're doing is we are just sitting with the Christ again, afresh, anew. We're re-examining parables that we've probably 
read a hundred times. But the beautiful thing about parables is that the kids right now are going to be reading the exact same parable that you and I are going to read. And it will speak to them right where they are at. And for us, as we dive into it, hopefully it will again captivate our hearts and lay hold of our minds and afresh and anew speak to us today. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right. So if you would grab your Bibles, open them up to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. We are going to continue on with one of these parables today. In Luke 18, um, well, first off, we've been mostly in Matthew so far. All three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, cover the parables, talk through uh, these stories that Jesus tells. John doesn't even share one of them. He uh, takes a totally different approach. John's approach is, I want to tell you what the miracles that God uh, or that Jesus Christ uh, did among us, what they tell us about who he is and his character, and he calls them signs, and he say they all point to who Jesus is. Now, the other uh, writers of the gospel dive into the parables, these stories Jesus tells, and they give us a rich view of who he is and what the kingdom of God is like. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to skip that first parable. I think we're going to come back to that in a couple weeks. But we're going to skip that first parable and pick up in verse 9. Uh, Luke chapter 18, verse 9, here's what it says. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. So this is going to be fun. This is what I love about these parables is that Luke doesn't like make it subtle at all. Like he leads in with, this thing is coming for your throat and it's going to latch on and it's not going to let go today. Right? This is not going to be a story about a fluffy sheep or a coin that got lost and swept up, but this is going to be something that is going to step on our toes today. And if it doesn't, something went wrong. So he just goes after it. He says, this is written, Jesus spoke this to people who trusted um, in their own righteousness, had great confidence in their own righteousness, and scorned everyone else. Why is it that those two go so hand in hand, so perfectly most of the time? Is it something about the fact that when you scorn everyone else, it's a little bit easier to have great confidence in yourself? I would imagine that probably has something to do with it. And I love that it says Jesus tells this story to some. Who's he talking to? Yeah. He's talking to you and he's talking to me. I mean, you could think that it's Judas, or maybe you could say it's Peter, but in reality, probably he's talking to you and to me. But here's what I love about it. It does not say, Jesus told this story about some. That's a big difference. Jesus isn't talking about some who had great confidence. He is talking to some who have great confidence in their own righteousness. I am so thankful that Jesus is not in heaven telling stories about me. (laughs) Hey, Michael, did you hear the latest about Alan? You know what I'm saying? But instead, when he tells this story, he's not telling it about them. He's talking to them. Why is he talking to them? So that they might hear and they might understand and they might grasp something from it. And so for you and for me, understanding that this is written to you and to me and that we should from this have our toes stepped on a little bit. Now let's get into the story And again, if it doesn't step on our toes, something went wrong. Here's the story. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. Now, 
For us, there's a little bit of a difficulty here, and this happens whenever we've read parables over and over and over again, and we're coming back to them afresh and anew. We know what happens, right? Like, we know the punchline to this story already. And because we know that the Pharisee is going to be the bad guy and the tax collector is actually going to be the good guy, what happens is it flattens out the entire story. But when Jesus initially told this story, remember who's he talking to. He's talking to people who would be like, Pharisee, yeah, tax collector, boo, right? Like they get that and that's the approach that they have. If you know the punchline already, it'll flatten it out. It's like a joke that you already know the punchline to. A priest, a pastor, and a rabbit walked into a bar. And the rabbit said, I think I'm a typo. Give it a moment. (laughs) Ask somebody else to explain it to you. All right. A mushroom walks into a bar. And the bartender says, we don't serve your kind around here. And the mushroom says, why not? I'm a... See? Wasn't nearly as funny because some people knew the punchline already. And did you notice that everybody who went, fun guy, like groaned right before saying it. And then there were like four or five people who were like, okay, I'll give the pastor a couple chuckles out of the goodness of my heart. But when you know the punchline, the joke's not as funny as if you don't. And it's the same with the story. If we read this story and we're just like, okay, we know the Pharisee's the bad guy, the tax collector is the good guy, we miss out when Jesus was originally telling this story. We miss out on what he's trying to get across. The whole point is that when you hear Pharisee, you cheer. And when you hear tax collector, you boo and you hiss. That's the point. The point is, these two guys walk into the temple, and one of them's a hero, and one of them's a villain. And then Jesus tells what happens. Both of them pray. And the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people. Cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. This prayer started so good, right? I thank you, God. Right? Like, that's a good way to start a prayer. I thank you, God. It is giving gratitude to God. But did you notice that that is actually the only time God is mentioned in this prayer? He mentions God once, and then he mentions himself five times. I thank you, God, that I, 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 I. God, I thank you for me. Right? Like this guy has something wrong with this prayer. And it starts so good, it acts as if, or at first pass, it's like, okay, I thank you, God. And you're like, okay, man, I thank God along with him. And then it's like, I thank you that I'm not a cheater. And I'm not an adulterer. And I'm not stealing from people. I'm not a sinner. I'm certainly not like that tax collector over there. He says, I thank you that I am not all of these things. His approach to God is totally in relation to his approach to other people, right? His relationship with other people. He starts and says, I thank you that I'm not that person. And I thank you I'm not that person. And I certainly, and then he's got even like an example right in front of him. All he has to do is look out of the corner of his eye and he sees the tax collector also standing in the temple. And I sure thank you I'm not that guy. I mean, this guy is the prettiest girl at the party, right? Like, and he knows it too. And when you're the prettiest girl at the party, you do you. But when you're not the prettiest girl, when my wife is there, then it's a totally different ball game, right? Like you can't take credit for all those things just like, but he, at this moment, he's standing in the temple and he knows that when it comes to the people standing in the temple on this particular day, he's got it down pat. He looks over at the tax collector and he says, whoo, 
I'm definitely not that guy. Can we do an experiment here real quick? Real quick. You're going to regret saying thank you to me for being your pastor. But if you don't mind, just closing your eyes. Just do this for me. Close your eyes. Here you go. Let's close your eyes. I need you right now to picture in your mind the worst singer at praise assembly. Not the worst sinner, <laughs> the worst singer. Okay, so some of you are pi picturing Kevin, um, and some of you are picturing me, but some of you are picturing that person who sits behind you that you never make eye contact with. On the way in, the way out, you know who it is, but you never turn around and just like, you know, but you don't. You, you just, you can picture them perfectly. Now, if you can't picture anybody, three things. Number one, good for you. Number two, everybody else is probably picturing you. <laughs> and number three, isn't that a great place to be? Because when you can't picture anybody else in worship, it frees you up to focus on the Lord. Man, there are so many distractions in worship and there are so many things that could pull us away from it. But ultimately, all those things do is they keep us from focusing our eyes where our eyes need to be focused. And the thing about this tax collector or this uh, Pharisee is, as he comes in, his eyes are everywhere but where they should be. They're on himself and they're on everybody around him. They're certainly not on the Lord. You know what C.S. Lewis said about this? He said, a proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you're looking down, you can't see above you. Yep. And that's what this Pharisee does. He walks into the temple and he looks towards heaven, but in reality, he's looking all around him. And he says, oh, I thank you I'm not that person. And I thank you I'm not that person. And then he continues on. Here's, here, I love this. He says, I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. So for the Jewish people, there was only one required fast. One day a year, Yom Kippur, the, the Day of Atonement, which was actually just a couple of Sundays ago. On the, on the Day of Atonement, there was the moment where they were supposed to recognize their own sin. And then what they would do is they would uh, put their hands on a goat, right? The, the, the high priest would put his hand on a goat, and uh, on the goat's head, and say, all right, we put all of our sins on this goat, and they would send it off into the wilderness, right? And carrying their sin off with them. And then they would get, um, uh, uh, they would, they would uh, uh, sacrifice and then they would put a little blood on the mercy seat and it would hopefully between them and God give them mercy, okay? But on this day of atonement, they were supposed to fast as a, a recognition of the fact that we are all sinful. So this was the one required day a year that everybody was supposed to fast in Judaism. Great thing about the Pharisees is, man, you can always one-up what you're required to do, right? So they didn't just observe the Torah, which was the first five books of the Bible. But on top of that, they had the Mishnah, which was like a, a commentary on the Torah. And they would perfectly observe that. So for every verse in the Torah, there's like five paragraphs in the Mishnah. But not just the Mishnah, they had the time. Talmud on top of that, which was a commentary on the Mishnah, which was a commentary on the, the Torah. And they observed all of it. And so for someone who was really on their game, they would fast two days a week, Monday and Thursday. And this is before fasting was cool and it was called intermittent fasting. This is fasting for Bible reasons. And boy, were they good at it. Two days a week. He says, I tithe on all of my income. And the funny thing about that is that the New Living Translation goes with income, but it's more than that. It's all of his wealth. In fact, in other places, it actually refers to the Pharisees tithing not just on their income, but on if they grew spices in their garden, they would tithe a tenth of it. So if you grew some parsley, they'd take 10% of it, one tenth of it, and set it aside to bring to the Lord everything of their increase. So this is somebody who tithes on the gross, not the net. Hallelujah. And then when he gets his tax return, he tithes on that too. And he borrows five bucks from a friend. He tithes on that too. 
Somebody gave him a roll of tape, toilet paper. He tithes on the toilet paper. I knew there was something about this guy that I really, really liked, you know? And so um, this Pharisee is above and beyond. There's what's required, and he does even more than that, and he knows it too. So he looks around and he sees, here's who I am compared to who they are. And then he sees the tax collector. You know, if he would have, according to the Mishnah, if he would have bumped into the tax collector, you know what he would have been required to do? If, if they were both walking into the temple that day and, and accidentally bumped into each other, you know what he would do first? He would spit immediately. Because that would show how seriously he takes sin. So he would spit immediately. He would go home, burn his clothes, and take a hot bath to purify himself. That's how serious he takes sin. So he glances over at the tax collector and he says, thank God that I'm not him. And even though they're standing apart, the distance between them seems even bigger than what it seems just in the story. Keep reading. Here's what the tax collector does. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. So here's the opposite end of the spectrum. And he comes in and he says, he's not even willing to look up to heaven. I'm not sure exactly what to think about that. It's just a total awareness of his sin. But he says, oh God, just be merciful on me, a sinner. And there's such a stark contrast between these two and the way they approach God. Uh, the, 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 the one who is uh, looking towards everybody else, not turning his eyes towards God, and then the, the one who won't look towards God, but in reality, he's not looking at anything but God in this moment. And that word, be merciful, that's a great word. That word mercy there, it actually is the same word that's used in relation to Yom Kippur. Where that blood was sprinkled was the mercy seat. It was the spot where as they poured the blood out or they sprinkled it on that spot, they would say, oh God, be propitiated towards me. Somehow look at this blood and find mercy on me. Then take what, be appeased towards me. Take this sin and somehow be merciful towards me. That's the word he uses. I mean, this is such a great word. Be merciful towards me. And you see the obvious differences between the Pharisee and the tax collector. And then here comes the punchline. Here it comes. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, you knew that was coming, right? Like, you've heard the story before, and you knew that the Pharisee was actually the one who was going to go away unjustified, and the other one was going to go away justified. But again, remember how people would have gotten this the very first time. I mean, this would have been terrifying to them. Like, absolutely horrific that the one who had done everything right and then some— is going away unjustified, while the one who came and had done nothing right up to that point, somehow in God's sight leaves justified. And that's another great gospel word, right? Like you've got mercy and propitiation, that word there. And then you've got the gospel word justification, being justified in God's eyes. That when God looks at him, he sees him as perfectly righteous in right standing with him. The old is gone and there's something else instead. This is a gospel message in a parable. And he says here, he says, this is the one who was justified. And what was the difference between them? It was Obviously, there was difference in probably how they dressed and how the world looked at them. But what was it between them and God that made them different? I think one of them had their eyes everywhere but on God, and the other one had their eyes only on God. And I think that's the big difference. You see, I don't think 
the issue with the Pharisee is that he overestimated his holiness. I think the issue was that he underestimated God's holiness. I think that in that moment, when he was looking around to compare himself to everybody else, the one thing he wasn't seeing was how perfect God is and how perfect God requires us to be. And so he leaves totally unjustified. And the tax collector who comes and only sees the Lord and his own sin leaves justified. Let's pray. God, I thank you that we are not like this Pharisee, that we are humble unlike him. And Okay, the problem with this parable is that it's a trap. The problem with this parable is while you read it, all along the way, you recognize how wrong the Pharisee is. And all along the way, you know how good it feels to not be him. And right there, the trap snaps and we're caught. Because when we say, thank God I'm not a Pharisee, We have done the exact same thing as him, but changed one word. That's not the point of this parable. The point of this parable is that both of these guys walked into the temple on the exact same ground with God. And only one of them knew it. So let's say... Let's say they both leave that day. Tax collector goes out first. Pharisee gives him plenty of space because he doesn't want to touch him. Tax collector goes first, stops on the way home for a falafel or whatever, lamb pot pie or whatever, okay? Stops for some food. And when he stops at the market, he gets it, doesn't realize it's got food poisoning, takes a big old bite as he's walking home, turns the corner, kicks the bucket. Pharisee didn't see any of that because he just let the tax collector have all that space. So out the Pharisee goes as well, same stand, gets the same falafel, um, goes on his way. Same thing happens to them. They're standing before heaven. God says, wish you wouldn't eat in that falafel, huh? (laughs) Pharisee says, yeah. God says, why should I let you into heaven? Pharisee says, well, you know, I, you should let me in because I'm not a tax collector. And I never cheated on my taxes. And I was faithful to my wife. And I made money for my kids. And I always voted Republican. And I didn't just vote in the presidential election. I voted in the congressional elections too. I even voted in the primaries, God. And I fasted. And I tithed. In fact, I fasted more than you wanted me to. And I tithed more than you expected me to. That's why you should let me in. And God would say, yeah, no. In comes the tax collector. I guarantee you he didn't walk in under his own power. He was standing at a distance in the temple on earth. What do you think he's going to be like in the very throne room of God? So he's carried in by Michael and Gabriel. God says, why should I let you into heaven? Give me one good reason. And that tax collector says, you shouldn't. I've got nothing but Jesus Christ. Maybe, just maybe, would you look at him and be merciful towards me? Maybe, just maybe, could you find a way 
to forgive my sins. And God says, that is enough. See, both of these people walked into the temple in the exact same place before God, but only one of them understood it. The Pharisee's issue was not that he was doing the wrong things. The Pharisee's issue was that he was trusting in the wrong things to make him right before God. And let me just say, this is the battle that we have every single day. This is not a one-time fight for us. This isn't a struggle that we battle it one time and then we're like, okay, I got that one in the belt. No, this is what the enemy comes at us with every single day. It's subtle. It's simple. It's just like, oh, yeah, yeah. But look at how that person's doing. And before you know it, you are in the seat of the Pharisee. You are doing the exact same thing that he did. Before we know it, we're trusting in our own power to get us there when it never even had a shot. And this is why as parents and grandparents, we need to tell our kids the gospel over and over and over again. Every single day when I'm dropping my kids off, actually only two days a week because they're in SPS. Two days a week when I'm dropping my kids off for school, I have to remind them of this. I have to remind them also to remember their backpack and to remember their lunchbox. And sometimes I need to remind them to take off their seatbelt before they get out of the car. And I have to remind them to put their mask on. But the thing that's most important that I remind them of is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying I pray with them every single morning to receive Jesus as their Savior, depending on how the morning has gone. (laughs) Can I get an amen from a parent somewhere? What I'm saying is these truths are something we need to come back to. And as parents and grandparents, our great goal should not be that our kids say yes, ma'am, or no, sir, but instead that they cling to Jesus Christ as their only hope. It's not morals, it's Jesus and only Jesus. And so this is why we come back to the gospel over and over again for our kids, but also for ourselves because the enemy is constant and he's slipping those little lies in here and there. But ultimately, this is the battle of our lifetimes. Remember the gospel. Preach yourself the gospel. Come back to the gospel over and over again. And I wonder sometimes what it must have been like for the disciples. What must have been like them? To know Jesus in a way that we won't know until the other side of glory. To be able to sit with him and hear from him And to know him in that way. And do you know what's beautiful? The promise of scripture is that we do. And that's our only hope. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4. But God is so rich in mercy. And he loved us so much. That even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So, oh, hear this. God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you. God saved you by his grace when you believed. You can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. It is in Christ Jesus and Christ alone. 
And every single day we remind ourselves of that truth. And every single day we sing that song afresh and anew, Christ alone, the cornerstone. And not one of us has the ability to glance out of the corner of our eyes and say, oh, but at least I'm not them. Because when we do that, we underestimate the very holiness, holiness of God. We say, oh, as if this is enough. But the enemy comes and he says, ah, but look at what that person did. At least you're not that. And what God says is, look at me. Your standing with me is nothing but what I have done for you. And Jesus Christ, you are seated with him in heavenly places. Never walk away from that. So if you're in here, you're joining us online, and you've never received that incredible and free gift, scripture is clear. Every single one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And unless we come back to that same place and realize that it is only in Christ, Christ alone, as Lord of our lives, that we do not have the forgiveness of sins and we thoroughly deserve the wrath of God. But Jesus Christ is enough. And Jesus Christ is the only one who's enough. And no one is better than you in his sight if you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's not about being good. It's about being his. It's not about being right. It's about being perfect in his sight because of what he has accomplished for us. We have people who would love to talk to you about this and what those next steps might look like in your life. All you need to do is text the name Jesus to the number 417-222-2800. Text Jesus to 417-222-2800 and someone will talk with you about what this can look like in your life, what it needs to look like in your life, and ultimately pray with you to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Don't miss this opportunity. There's no guarantee that on the way home today, you won't have another opportunity to come. This is it. Today is the day.